Live from New York City for our audience worldwide, Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, Chair Powell hikes the market his cuts as the economy delivers negative growth and price pressure remains elevated. We begin with the big issue, pricing out the Fed. We're beginning to hear some signs of that Fed pivot. The notion of a coming Fed pivot. There's two reasons to price the Fed pivot. Whether or not there is a recession. And the Fed is going to have to stop. We're still at great risk of a recession here. The second argument is that Chair Powell, in his unscripted remark, said we are at neutral. The pivot that everybody's talking about. Central to this is the view that there'll be this immaculate disinflation. We still see core inflation accelerating. I don't think Fed is pivoting here. Powell really endorsed this message of data dependence. They are selling enough optimism to the markets. The market is looking for a pivot. Where the markets are pricing right now is just not right. Financial markets seem to be pivoting prematurely. It's too early. Even the Fed itself, I suspect, doesn't know what it's going to do in September. And we don't either. Joining us now is JP Morgan's Kelsey Barrow, Morgan Stanley's Matt Hornback, and George Concarvis of MUFG. Awesome lineup to round out the week. Kelsey, let's begin with you. What is more important to Fed rates, this Federal Reserve, growth or inflation? Well, it's been an epic battle this week between downside risk to growth and upside and risk to inflation. I will admit the downside risk to growth probably won this battle, but I think the upside risk to inflation are still winning this war. Inflation is still what we need to be focused on. The Fed has told us they need to see compelling evidence that it's coming down. And honestly, we just don't see that compelling evidence yet. We don't see it when we look at the ECI number this morning. We don't see it when we look at the PCE number this morning or CPI. And so we do believe that the Fed is going to need to continue to hike rates at least 100 basis points more. And this pivot that everyone's talking about is too soon. Matt, is it too soon? Yeah. In, in, in fact, if anybody who has looked at the previous pivots from Chair Powell uh, will tell you is this is not the way in which he pivots. He, it's much more quick, it's much more abrupt, uh, and it's much more forceful. This was not a pivot from the Fed. You know, I do think that the downside in growth data that we've seen probably gives the Fed a little bit more confidence that at some point in the future, inflation will come back down to target. They're clearly looking at break-even inflation rates to give them uh, an additional sense of confidence. But you know, we think that uh, tips are still good value here, particularly in shorter tenors, John. We, we think that if the market really believes that this was a pivot, that's going to let financial conditions ease probably too much and ultimately increases the risks to even more inflation in the near term. If we're pricing out hikes and pricing in cuts and inflation's at 9%, George, inflation protection might make a bit of sense here. Absolutely. And I think like the, the market is trying to force the Fed's hand like it did with you know, putting in nearly 4% or you know, target on the Fed funds rate. I mean, this is a market that's trying to always uh, get ahead of the Fed. And I agree with what Matt's saying, too. Like, I mean, the market now is easing financial conditions for the Fed at a time where they're trying to tighten. It doesn't make any sense. This concept, the neutral rate, Larry Summers has come out swinging today. He spoke to David Weston, and this is what he said. Jay Powell said things that, to be blunt, were analytically indefensible. He went on to say there is no conceivable way that a 2.5% interest rate in an economy inflating like this is anywhere near neutral. Kelsey, can you speak to that? Well, we don't know where neutral is, and I'm not sure why Powell uh, stated that we are near it when it's not clear that we are. So what we did is we looked back at tightening cycles, the last four. When did the Fed stop? On average, they stopped when inflation was at 2.5%, the unemployment rate was at 4.5%, and then they kept the policy rate at the peak level at that terminal rate for about 10 to 12 months. We have a market right now that's pricing in Fed rate cuts uh, and a terminal rate. They'll stop at the end of the year while inflation is still above five. 
where the unemployment rate is still below four. And then they're also pricing in rate cuts after just three months. And I just really don't think that this is consistent with a with a uh, economy that is or a policy rate that is at neutral. And really what they need to be doing is moving the policy rate higher. higher. It's not clear we're at neutral yet. You can't see where are real rates now? And where were they the last time this Fed had to pivot? Yeah, so it's really incredible to me, you know, the Fed has moved rates 150 basis points just in the last two months. That's an incredibly fast pace. They want financial conditions to tighten. And what they got in response to this last policy meeting and this last 75 basis point rate hike was actually two-year real yields falling. Real yields are now negative again. And if you just think about where the real policy rate is today, it's still very negative around 700, minus 700 basis points. So that is not a policy stance that I would consider neutral. Matt, the road to September is long. There's two more CPI prints, there's two more labour market reports, there's a ton of data next week. What's more important to you then at this point? Is it the data or the Fed speak that I imagine you anticipate is going to push back against some of this? Well, well, John, we think that the inflation data is going to be pretty spicy over the next couple of months. So. Honestly, inflation is not really where I think markets are going to be focusing. They're going to be focusing on the growth data, John. So it's going to be important what we see in the labor market. It's going to be important what we end up seeing in the PMI numbers between now and September. Ultimately, in order to get the market to start moving higher in yield again, you're really going to need to see growth data rebound. You're going to need to see the market start thinking that maybe the next dot plot is going to have a higher terminal rate than the one that we had in June. And John, look, this was, in my view, the, the big mistake that Powell made was invoking a dot plot from six weeks ago. A lot has happened in the past six weeks. We've gotten some really strong inflation data, a very decent labor market report. So I just don't understand why he felt the need to bring up June's dot plot. That was a mistake. But he did. And we're going to get some new projections, another dot plot. George, when they make those changes, what would they look like? Look, I think at a minimum, they have to hold their ground. Um, and they, you know, there is a possibility to increase the long run dot. But I guess the question is, when we discuss neutral in this kind of you know, ambiguous world that we live in, of what is short term neutral versus long term neutral? And they're trying to thread the needle and they're trying to get us to, to a softer kind of inflation profile. And, you know, you know, invoking this, you know, long run dot as the, you know, we're back to neutral makes no sense. And so I feel like yeah, there, there is scope for them to, to, to push back. But I agree with Matt also that you know, growth, you know, growth numbers have to hang in here long enough into at least November uh, before they start giving us a criteria for pivoting. Otherwise, the market's going to try to force their hands. George, the first two lines of the statement that came out this week, they read as follows. Overall economic activity appears to have picked up after edging down in the first quarter. Job gains have been robust in recent months and the unemployment has remained low. That was June 15th. This was the update in July. The first two lines look like this. Recent indicators of spending and production have softened. Nonetheless, job gains have been robust in recent month and the unemployment rate has remained low. George, is it all about the labour market report in your mind, just based on where they were in June and where they are now in July? Yeah, I think we need to maintain uh, healthy job gains into you know, early Q3, uh, early uh, Q4 in order for them to you know, stay on track to getting us well above 3%. So, Matt, when you think about that, do we start to price in what we've priced out if we get a strong report next Friday? Well, it, John, it's going to take more than just one strong labor market report. But I do think that with the amount of negative term premium in the very front end of the yield curve, and bear in mind, uh, even with Powell invoking the June dot plot, uh, the market is still pricing well below that terminal dot. So. You know, there's a decent amount of negative term premium in the front end now. Every, you know, every good piece of growth type data we get out of this economy, it's going to make that policy, that market pricing of that policy rate move higher, closer to the dot plot. But, John, it's going to take more than one report. Kelsey, tell me how you'd play this yield curve story now. Twos and tens were close to 350 the day before the June meeting, June 14th. Tens are down to 264. Twos are down to 289. What would you look, be looking for to happen here through the curve, twos out to tens? 
Yeah, so we have been positioned for curve flatteners. We do think that this battle between downside growth risks and upside inflation risks does lend itself to higher front end yields, but more stable long end yields. Uh, so a continuation of this curve flattener or a twist flattener is kind of what you're seeing today. And just to go back to you know the idea that Matt spoke about in terms of inflation break evens here and the front end of the inflation curve being attractive, uh, there is a lot of positive the carry and in inflation. Uh, we do agree that uh, they do have some value. But the other way that you could just play that uh, being uh, bullish on near term inflation is just to be short the front end. Um, and, and we do think that two year yields should be higher than 3% in this environment. Um, and, and that's where they're going. George, do you share that view? Uh, look, I largely do. But the thing is, most of the, the rally compression has come from break evens tightening. We've had some break even widening again in the, in the last couple of days. But the big you know, compression and lower uh, rate environment that we've been in since the June highs have been mostly the, the, the bond market is viewing the Fed as credible at fighting inflation. That's kind of contradictory if you think about then how low can rates really go overall if they're trying to raise them. So at some point, there should be a parallel shift higher in rates too. So it's not going to just be the front end. So I mean, I, I, I was very bullish and constructive the intermediate sector of you know the seven to 10 year part of the Treasury curve. I think that, that trade has basically run its course. And the whole, the whole market should be kind of selling off from here. Matt, final word here. Well, I think the one thing that we can't ignore in this discussion about the U.S. economy is what's happening outside of the United States. And ultimately, part of this flattening that we're seeing today, I think, is ultimately related to just this idea that other central banks, aside from the Fed, are going to have to keep tightening as well. We got some really strong inflation numbers out of Europe. So ultimately, the ECB is going to have to keep tightening. Global growth does not look great here, John, and those downside risks should put some downward pressure on longer term interest rates in the U.S. We've got to talk about Europe and the ECB up next. Kelsey, Matt, George sticking with us. Coming up on the program, up next, the auction block. America's biggest banks swarming the primary market, boosting monthly sales above estimates. That conversation up next. Jonathan Farrow, this is Bloomberg Real Yield. It's time now for the auction block, where we kick things off here in the United States, with junk borrowers remaining on the sidelines. The market pricing less than $2 billion this month, the slowest July since at least 2006. U.S. high-grade bond sales topping monthly estimates, pricing more than $60 billion in the last two weeks of the month. And in Europe, the primary market recording its 28th day of the year without a single deal, helping close out the slowest month of 2022. Sticking with Europe, Goldman's chief economist Jan Hassius expecting a Traction. We are forecasting a recession in the euro area. It would be concentrated in Germany and Italy, which are the two countries that are most dependent on Russian gas. It's a very difficult situation for them. The, the economy, despite today's better second quarter numbers, is looking pretty weak. But at the same time, inflation is much too high. Rock and a hard place and an ECB somewhere in between. Kelsey Berra, Matt Hornback, George Concarva still with us. Kelsey, what is this ECB's next move? It's going to be a difficult road ahead for Europe. Uh, we agree that growth is going to slow. It's going to slow materially. Although the GDP numbers this morning did surprise to the upside, the weakness did come from Germany. On the other hand, we also saw this morning that Europe is still dealing with inflation just like the rest of the world. So we think that the ECB is going to need to continue to hike rates. I think even another 50 basis point rate hike is possible for them. Their job right now is to try to get to a neutral policy stance as quickly as possible, seeing uh, what's going on around them with growth slowing. Uh, an attempt to just get to neutral is what they're looking to do as quickly as possible. Matt, the debate around the Fed is pretty divided. Around the ECB, it's incredibly one-sided. When I speak to people, they always say the same thing. The window for the ECB is like that small. They've got one more meeting left and then it's game over, recession. Do you think they can go much further than another 50 basis points on September 8th? Well, well John, our, our chief European economist, Jens Eisenschmidt, is looking for another 50 basis point rate hike from the ECB uh, in September. And he thinks they probably keep going uh, into the end of the year. So, Look, I mean, the ECB has a, an inflation mandate, John. It's, it, it's a singular mandate. It's something that it needs to take very seriously. 
Uh, and so even though growth is slowing, um, we are expecting con a continued series of rate hikes from the ECB. And George, yields are rolling over. The Italian 10-year last month in June, in the middle of the month, was 4% plus. It's about 3% now. In Germany, it was close to 180. It's sub 1% now. George, what do you make of that rollover in European yields, not just in the core part of Europe, but on the periphery too? Well, absolutely. So the bond market is, is calling the bluff on this. And I mean, you can get, I guess, a really super inverted uh, euro curve, I guess, at some point if the ECB does, uh, keeps hiking it with, with no abandon. But I do think at some point, you know, the, the window definitely is closing for, for, the, for the ECB. And, and, in, and in addition, I mean, I feel like this is like this, we're all trying to figure out this give and take between inflation and, uh, and growth. And Europe is in a much, much harder situation than the U.S., for sure. It's the same question. How much weakness in the economy are both central banks willing to tolerate? Now, Kelsey, we believed for a fraction, a moment of time, that it was all about inflation, and all of a sudden the market's pivoted and said, no, it's all about growth again. Recession in Europe, Goldman, JP Morgan calling for that this year at some point in the back half of the year. Now, Kelsey, I'm wondering, when you think about the Fed and now think about the ECB, how much weakness in the economy are they willing to tolerate to get inflation back down? Well, looking at the Fed to start, it really hinges on the labor market and the unemployment rate still being very low. This is really a linchpin right now um, that is allowing them to feel like, although this decision is, is hard, it's not really that hard because unemployment is still low, job growth is still high, you're looking at 300,000 uh, average payrolls growth per month. Uh, and so, yes, the job is hard. Uh, manufacturing is rolling over. Real GDP is slowing. Uh, but they'll lean on that unemployment and still feel like uh, policy rates can go higher. With Europe, it's a little bit more difficult. We haven't necessarily seen the unemployment uh, backdrop change materially, but we do think that that's going to be turning. And that's why that window is just smaller for, for the ECB. Um, I'll just add that, you know, we have the BOE coming up as well. And, and we think that, although it may be a split decision, a 50 basis point rate hike from, from them is also possible. Another 50 basis points from them, maybe another 50 basis points from the ECB. Matt Hornbeck, you mentioned something really important five minutes ago. It's the relationship between what happens in Europe and how that spreads out, bleeds out to the rest of the bond market worldwide, including here in the Treasury market. Matt, can you build on that just a little bit more? Well, well, John, I'm going to build on that by giving uh, a shout out to the Bank of Japan. I mean, this bank, this central bank has been, you know, the butt of jokes for, for many years now, and they've called this absolutely correctly. Now that we're starting to see some downside risks to growth in the United States, you saw a dramatic strengthening of the yen this week, John, uh, mind boggling strength in, in the yen, dollar yen down several figures. Uh, that's not going to help uh, inflation go up in Japan. So, you know, if you're thinking about uh, the bond market here from a global perspective, uh, yields in Japan are going to continue probably to fall from here. That's going to also weigh on yields in the United States. I think uh, international investors, particularly those sitting in Japan, are going to take a fresh pair of eyes to the U.S. Treasury market and probably put money to work. Dollar yen, a 2% move. Euro yen, a 2% move. And I'll admit, I'll put my hands up. Matt, I called it Operation Ostrich about a month or so ago. I'm still not sure whether it, this works out, but it's looked like a better week for the Bank of Japan, that's for sure. Matt Hornback, George Concarvers, Kelsey Barrow sticking with us. I feel like Matt knew that, and that's why Matt said what he said. Still ahead, the final spread, the week ahead, featuring a host of global PMIs. And the payrolls report is just around the corner. And I had to take a second take a little bit earlier because I cannot believe it's come back around that soon. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, I'm Jonathan Farrow. This is Bloomberg Real Yield. Time now for the final spread, the week ahead. Coming up over the next week, a whole host of global PMIs coming throughout the week, including prints from the US, China and the Eurozone. Fed speak, making a return with Evans and Bullard on Tuesday, followed by President Mester later in the week. I imagine you're going to hear a lot of Fed speak next week. We get a Bank of England rate decision on Thursday. Kelsey Barrow and the team looking for 50 basis points. And we round out the week with the US payrolls report this Friday. And I can tell you the current estimate is 250K, the highest 300K and the low 
is about 50k. Back with us, Kelsey Barrow, Matt Horn, back, George Concarvis. Kelsey, Bank of America had a note out this morning and they talked about the weakness reaching the labour market and the labour market should, quote, slow quickly and soon. Do you expect it to reach the labour market pretty soon? We are seeing some signs of weakness in the labor market, and I do want to acknowledge that, particularly in the claims data, uh, the trend has not been uh, very friendly. Uh, it's been trending higher now for a material period of time, but the level is still low. Overall, though, when I look at where the unemployment rate is going, payroll's growth would need to actually decelerate quite a bit to get a material rise in the unemployment rate without an increase in labor force participation. So my bias is to say that unemployment for this year probably stays below 4%, but we should be expecting a deceleration in payrolls growth because 300 to 400,000 is still consistent with an economy that is operating at above trend growth. And what the GDP data is telling us is that we're probably moving into more of a below trend growth environment. Kelsey, another way of putting what you just said is that this Federal Reserve will have to hike more than people expect to take some heat out of this labor market. Is that correct? That is correct. They still have more work to do. Seems to be the bottom line for a lot of people, a Fed that has more work to do. We've got some time for the rapid fire round. Let's do that right now. Three quick questions and three quick answers. Here's your first question. Payrolls next week, I went through the numbers, 250K is the estimate. 300K is the high, 50K is the low. Payrolls next week, do we get a negative print? Not just next week, but this quarter. At some point this quarter, do we get a negative print? Yes or no, Kelsey? No. Matt? No. George? No. Too soon. Fed's next move, 25, 50, 75 or more. September, Fed's next move, 25, 50, 75 or more. Matt? Our house call is for 50 bits. Got to go with the house call. George? Same thing, 50. Kelsey? I'll go with the big 75. 75, there we go. That would be a shocker for a lot of people, given what we've priced at the moment this week. Final question, and Kelsey, I know what your answer is to this, so I'll go to you first. How much work does this Fed have left to do? Is it 50, less than 50 basis points, 50 to 100, or 100 plus? Less than 50, 50 to 100, or 100 plus? George? 50 to 100. Matt? Uh, more than 100, John. Kelsey, I'll come last to you just to give you the final word. Go on, Kelsey. 100 plus. To the three Thanks, of you. John. Thank you. Kelsey Barron, Matt Hornback, George Concarvis, thank you very much. And to you at home, thank you very much. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. This was Bloomberg Real Yield. This is Bloomberg TV.